Now, on Monday, France announced that it's in favor of canceling almost $5 billion of debt owed by Sudan as part of efforts to help the country in its transition to democracy. Here's Ross Cullen reporting. Sudan is seeking relief on at least $50 billion of external debt. It's already secured bridge loans from the United States and the United Kingdom, and it now has further aid from France, which is Sudan's second biggest bilateral creditor after Kuwait. Sudan's economy was crippled for decades by sanctions imposed on former President Omar al-Bashir and his government. En ce qui concerne la France, as far as France is concerned, I want to tell you right now, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, we are in favour of a pure and simple cancellation of Sudan's debt, of cancelling almost $5 billion. That is the meaning of our support for your transition. And it's the meaning of our commitment to the youth of Sudan who made your revolution. The summit that was hosted by the French leader convened voices from across Sudanese society, as well as Sudan's neighbours like Egypt and Ethiopia, along with international organisations to try to spur investment in the country and aid its transition. Now that political transition got underway after a popular up uprising saw the military overthrow al-Bashir, who'd been president for 30 years. Sudan's prime minister hailed his country's return to the international community after three decades of isolation. Today, with your leadership and generous support on this, we are able to create this last hair deal, which would signal the return of Sudan to the development community. And this is where we will be able to create the jobs that will respond to the aspiration of the young people. The conference also heard from Sudanese youth, climate and feminist activists. Many of them participated in the 2019 protests, which focused initially against rising living costs, but quickly widened into demands for the removal of President Bashir and his government. Sudan is currently being led by a joint civilian military council as it moves towards democracy with elections set to take place by 2022. Omar al-Bashir came to power in 1989 in a military coup and he was ousted the same way in 2019. He could still face trial on charges of war crimes and genocide at the International Criminal Court. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. Well, let's now take apart today's discussions further. We're joined by Professor Patrick Bond. He's a professor at the University of Western Cape School of Government. Great to have you with us on the show today, Professor. Now, as we just mentioned, at Monday's summit, uh, France pretty much offered to facilitate uh, the clearing of Sudan's arrears to the IMF uh, through that $1.5 billion bridge loan. It also kicked off talks on broader debt relief uh, for Sudan going forward. Now, in light of this, how effective do you think this meeting uh, has been and will be in addressing debt relief and, of course, providing the much-needed capital and financing that Africa needs? Well, in some ways, what Sudan's uh, deal is, it's, uh, is uh, debt cancellation. And I think that's incredibly important as a step forward from discussions over the last year that have been bogged down about debt relief, about marginal changes at a time a sort of force majeure, a major change occurred, much of the debt being odious, and it's very difficult to pay. Many uh, African countries either defaulting or close to default. So this is an important moment. And look, Emmanuel Macron, compared to predecessors, um, Hollande and Sarkozy, is seen as more dynamic and trying to get Af uh, France's reach less paternalistic, Franc Afrique, into the Francophone section, and as the Sudan deal suggests, moving elsewhere. Look, the main thing on the investment side is uh, France is still reliant for its inflows from Africa, the profits, largely on fossil fuels, and one company especially, Total. And that will be a problem. In northern Mozambique, Total said to withdraw because of the insurgency there. And there's big debates here in South Africa, in the Western Cape, about whether Total uh, really is going to do its offshore uh, gas deal. So it's a very uh, mixed picture, uh, but France is looking a little bit better than it has in the past at a time when Germany has been vetoing the vaccine intellectual property waiver, a very important problem for Merkel, and of course in Britain, no longer in Europe. Uh, Boris Johnson has a very different reputation on the continent, one of racism. Mm. 
Well, yeah, quite right. You're, it's certainly a change in tone from France. Uh, but going back to what African leaders are looking uh, for at this summit, uh, they pretty much want a moratorium. Uh, at least they say they want a moratorium on the service of all external debt uh, until the end of this pandemic, not just the service of public debt. Uh, they also want better conditions to access financing. Uh, by that, they mean longer maturities, lower rates uh, going forward. Uh, what are your thoughts on the likelihood, despite the change in tone, uh, that we'll see this happening after this summit? Well, indeed, remember that uh, there was a debt relief in 2005 and 6 that the G7, the biggest countries, with the multilaterals, the IMF and the World Bank, that they'd organized taking uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's debt for the lowest income countries from 200 billion down to 130, so it was manageable. Now we're well over 400 billion. Some of the debt is new to China, but the big debate is whether this um, pandemic will continue to cripple much of what Africa has been trying to do, which is industrialize, balance, uh, instead of just export of commodity prices. And the difficult case that Africans will make is that they deserve the debt relief. In the case of, say, Mozambique, uh, because of the corruption in some of the debt, from the Mozambican government, as well as a Swiss bank and a Russian bank. But there is much of the corruption and the odious debt to be factored in. But also commodity prices are beginning uh, to boom. And in fact, there's talk of a commodity super cycle, which will benefit Africa. So this is going to be a, a strong case in, in coming weeks and months that Africa actually can't afford to pay over the period that, let's say, this pandemic continues for a year, a year and a half, we're very slow to get vaccines. Only today in South Africa are vaccines beginning to move beyond health workers. And that means, indeed, uh, economic stress for quite some time. Mm. Now, of course, the IMF was uh, a big part of all the conversations going on. Uh, World leaders, they've agreed to issue uh, that $650 billion uh, IMF special drawing rights. Uh, we'll see that directly pumping about $34 billion uh, into African economies. Now, at this summit, we saw President Macron trying to persuade uh, developed world leaders to concede, c consider reallocating uh, a substantial part of their portions uh, of that special drawing, uh, of their special drawing rights to poorer nations. What's your take on his argument and the sort of support he's going to see from this? Well, yes, look, Macron is doing what most of the advanced capitalist countries were trying to do just a year ago. And Donald Trump vetoed it, along with Narendra Modi from uh, India because of the India-Pakistan debate. But, of course, Trump and his Treasury Secretary, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, just what, didn't want the IMF to print more money. And this is a very interesting moment because we remember the last time, 2009, when there was a special drawing rights, the, the IMF printing its own currency in effect, giving the right, uh, basically hard currency spending to the whole world. But as you point out, if it's 650 billion, Africa gets a small fraction, 34 billion. And Macron is correct to say, well, maybe uh, given the inequalities in the world, the desperation on the continent of Africa, that should change. Here's the dilemma. Once that money starts being circulated, it's a special drawing right, it's a kind of a hard currency substitute. Then the next question is, well, who's winning? And what we saw from 2009 to 2013, when this quantitative easing, printing of money from the northern banks, the uh, US Fed, the British Central Bank, and European Central Bank, the Japanese Bank, that really fueled financialization, and it didn't really trickle down. So will they make the same mistake again? That will be up to a more enlightened member of the G7, Emmanuel Macron. But he's still going to be up against the standard U.S. neoliberal power structure, Germany in a more conservative mode, Britain very hard to predict, and massive crises like climate, the vaccine apartheid, and inequality, uh, making uh, this kind of an event for Africa important to take advantage of. Because right now, the rest of the balance of forces is very much arrayed against the continent, so much so that it may be finally time for African leaders to say, well, we won't pay it, we can't pay it. And whether you give us SDRs or not, the system is rigged and we shouldn't pay it. Quite interesting. Well, we do have to leave it there, Professor. Many thanks for your insights on the show today. That, of course, was Professor Patrick Bond uh, from the University of the Western Cape School of Government.